thank you for joining us for this episode of We've Got Issues. I'm Nancy Furness and I'm here with Brad Nickerson and um, we'd like to thank Tri-Cities Community Television and TELUS Optic for making this show possible. So today our interview is taking place in Coquitlam at Fountainhead Network and I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of Coquitlam First Nations. So we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and who um, continue to care for the waters and all that is above and below. So we have an upcoming municipal election in uh, the Tri-Cities on October 15th. So today we will be talking to Matt Dejonlik and he is um, throwing his hat in the ring for a position as city councillor in Coquitlam. So thank you for joining us today, well, Matt. Thank you, Nancy and Brad, for having me. It was so, so great to come, to come here and hang out with you today and talk all things local government. I'm really excited. Well, we're really happy to have you. And we were wondering if maybe we could just start off with having you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what inspired you to run for uh, Coquitlam City Council? Yeah, it, it, it's a really good question. So um, I've, I've grown up in this community. Um, it's a community I love and, and have been involved in for, oh gosh, years. Um, you know, I think what really inspired me was my partner and I are looking to make our home here. We're, we're both renters and I think like a lot of young couples and young families, we're faced with that dilemma of how we're gonna raise our family here with the affordability crisis being what it is. Um, you know, families here, we wanna be able to stay here and have our kids grow up with their grandparents and, and in the community that we know and we're, we're faced with that dilemma of looking, do we, do we have to move, right? So, you know, I, I wanted to run to really make sure that we're having a voice of, of a lot of young families because I, I do believe that to have a diverse community, we need to have diverse housing options. Uh, I want to see a Coquitlam where young families can raise their kids, where mm -hmm. seniors are able to downsize and stay going to the churches they know or in the community groups that they're familiar with. I think it's, it's so important to building a robust community. Mm -hmm. And I th think you have um, mentioned like different housing options you think are important. Can you tell us a little bit about what kind of options you're talking about? Well, it's really that missing middle that we're, we're just finally getting to catching up on. And we're seeing all levels of government beginning to recognize the need for more co-ops, mm -hmm. three bedroom condos, row homes, townhouses. It's filling in the community with some of that gentle density that's been missing. I think too often we've, you know, we've, we've deferred to the market for years to say, well, you know, all we need are 500 square foot condos or big mansions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not working for people. We need housing options that work for real people. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I want to add my voice to, is to be able to push for these kind of things that families can raise their kids in and seniors can downsize into. Um, it's, it's so important to have a community where the people who make it work can live, whether they be firefighters, nurses, teachers, city workers, where seniors can stay and where people can come to raise their kids. It's, that's how you get a thriving, healthy community. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we're asking enough of developers? There's a lot of development going on in Coquitlam right now. And do you think that we're asking enough of developers or is there something more? And if so, what, what kind of things should we be um, asking developers to um, sort of contribute when they're, when they're building in Coquitlam? Well, it, it's a great question and, it, and it's where having that working relationships with developers is so important because I've, I've had a number of conversations with them and, and they too, you know, th these are companies that have people that work for them, young people, mm -hmm they're looking for housing as well and they recognize too the need to have more below market rental and there's ways to make that happen whether it be perhaps allowing for more density to include uh, below market housing something we're desperately in need of catching up on um, we could be looking at trading things like maybe less underground parking next to a skytrain station to build more below market pieces mm -hmm. um, you know, it's council's responsibility to set up the criteria and frame and needs of the community and for the developers to be able to go in and build that. Um, I'm a big believer in, it to, you know, there's no silver bullet and it's bringing various people together to solve the problem. Um, we're seeing great projects throughout the lower mainland. I'm looking at the BCGEU project in Burnaby that just got passed where they're bringing hundreds of affordable housing units coming. You know, as a city councilor, what I want to do is go out and pursue those kind of creative opportunities, um, whether it be with union, whether it be with faith-based groups that are 
sitting on quite a bit of land, pulling in the provincial government, the federal government, mm -hmm. to be able to make good housing projects happen. Now, you have a background with um, working at the provincial level um, as far as like housing and, and that sort of thing. So can you maybe just tell us very briefly what the role of the municipality is versus provincial when it comes to affordable housing or looking at those different housing options? Yeah, and I mean, the, one of the key things that a municipal government is responsible for is land use. And yes, we need the provincial government to be able to supply a lot of that um, okay. monetary piece to make projects happen. But councils have a responsibility to be asking developers and planning for affordable housing options, mm -hmm. to be planning for childcare, schools, all of the pieces that make a community work. That is the responsibility of the municipal government. So I've, I've never bought into it, and I've always found it frustrating when levels of government pass the buck. Um, mm -hmm. Housing is a municipal issue, it's a provincial issue, and it's a federal issue. And I think we need to recognize that all three levels of government have a key responsibility to making uh, affordable housing happen. Yeah, and it's Did, never been clear to me, so thank you for sort of providing some clarification there. And sorry, Brad. No, that's all right. Um, so do you think it's, do you think the issue is just a council and developers issues, or are there any other forces that are, are holding that back as well? Well, I think the federal government is, is a big piece, and we need to get back to the days of where the federal government was funding affordable housing options, where they were funding co-ops. I mean, we had such a huge mm -hmm. investment from Ottawa back in the 70s, and then it just completely dried up. Austerity became the message of the day, and right. governments completely pulled out of that. And now we're really dealing finally with the, the consequences of what happened with that. Um, we need more co-ops. We need more... Yeah. Uh, investment from the federal government, um, direct investment of it, not just financing from CMHC to make affordable housing happen. And this is where, and, and, and we also need to think too about how we define affordable housing, because there's that below market piece that might be for someone who's, who's really struggling, who maybe has been unhoused, who's just getting back into having a home and being a renter for the first time. Um, and then there's also those people who might just be you know, a working class couple or single mom who's trying to make ends meet and just needs just needs cheaper rent. And right. so there's that continuum of housing. I, I like to think of housing very much as it's a staircase, right? And, and you can't just have the step at the top and the step at the bottom. You need everything in between so people can move up that ladder. When you, when you say, when, when you speak about it, people just need cheaper rent, um, I, I don't see that as an issue. Well, it's a, it doesn't matter what I see. Um, is that just an issue between city council and developers again? Cheaper rent. Where does the where does the where does the rent issue um, come from in this situation that you see? I'm I'm just curious about that. Well, I mean, the province has a role in subsidizing um, certain units of housing, of financing to allow for developers to be building cheaper rental units. Um, mm -hmm. This is where council does have a role to be able to say to developers, hey, if, you know, we're letting you build quite a bit of density here, or maybe we can trade off some development contribution money, maybe we can trade off some, some other needs that we would be asking you for to be building a certain amount of rental and guaranteeing it and making sure it's at a certain threshold of rent. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we know that 30% of someone's income is, that is classified by CMHC as affordable rental. Um, how do we get more of those also, those rent geared to income units? Um, those are huge for helping with affordability. Yeah, but our affordability issue isn't just about, um, isn't just about building. Uh, it, it's spaces that exist already, houses that exist already, and it, it, there are other forces that are pushing those rents at that level, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it, you're not, I, I think you're not going to be able to, um, and I don't mean this in argument, I mean it in a, no, a, in a discussion yeah. approach. Yeah. Um, we're not just going to um, solve the affordability crisis by pointing the finger at developers and what they're building, the fact that they're building stuff that's not um, necessarily suitable for, the, for different demographics. But I have three daughters, so I'm speaking from my own situation, I have three daughters. Um, two of who still live in our house, who are well into their 20s, because they can't afford to move out even into an apartment somewhere. That has more to do, I think, what I see with, with investments, investments that have happened. Do you think that that's something that you can, some kind of knowledge like that, you can bring to a city council? 
Well, I think, and, and we're, we've seen that be a huge challenge of mm-hmm. the, the, the speculative market has certainly driven up housing costs in a huge way. We know that for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see the provincial government and federal government be taking steps to address that demand side of things. But where on the city council level we have work to do is, one is lobbying for that and really just addressing the need of saying our community needs these measures. But also then, like you talked about on the rental piece, is making sure we're building more rental. Um, mm-hmm. it, there is a supply piece to this as well. Yeah. Um, I don't believe there's a silver bullet to fo- solving the affordability crisis. Um, it's a how uh, it's, it needs to be on the supply side too, and that is where local government plays a huge role because they are in charge of land use planning. And I think if we can talk a little bit about, about affordability too, I think there's, mm-hmm. there's there's other components to it as well. Um, well I think about ten dollar a day childcare space. Um, I think that is huge for affordability. And yes, the province is responsible for that. But again, coming to that land use piece, this is where councils have a, a role to be saying to developers, what are you planning for childcare space? Mm-hmm. We're looking at a huge development in Coronation Park. How do we say to developers, we need to ensure that there's also adequate childcare space because we're gonna be having a lot of couples who might be working two jobs to pay their mortgage and they need that affordable um, childcare. I guess, could you just uh, maybe expand on that? Um, And how do you see a livable community? Like what makes, uh, we need affordable housing, we need childcare, so those are two important components. But what else do you see as part of a a livable community? What other components would be important there? Yeah, I mean, like when I think about a healthy community, I think it's one where people know their neighbors. You can see kids out on the street playing hockey. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, that, that to me is, is a, healthy neighborhood where where communi- community does such a good job of taking care of each other and I think we need that too in addition to government um, it, it's it's such, such a big part for mental health it's for taking taking care of each other helping each other out um, so I see too this is where community centers play a huge role uh, public spaces libraries I'm a big supporter of public libraries I was a trustee on the board for Coquitlam's Public Library for the previous eight years I'm not on now, but um, I see libraries as a huge component to that. Uh, It's investing in things like sports for kids, uh, our senior centers. Those are really what foster community. Spaces that get people out of their homes too Mm -hmm. and meeting each other and engaging with each other. That is so important to our mental health and and our uh, community resiliency. Right, now libraries, we can access so much information online and digitally, but I I think you've pointed out that it's not just about the access to, like we don't use libraries just to go and take out books, they're actually community hubs and they fulfill a lot of other roles as well. I think recently in Coquitlam there was a funding shortfall um, Mm -hmm. on the libraries, so there was some staffing cuts and, and things that happened as a result of it. Is there something that can be done at the municipal level to ensure that supports are in place for libraries so that doesn't happen in, in the future? Do you see a role that you could play Well, there? I think it's it's having counselors that support these kind of mm-hmm. uh, spaces, right? Um, counselors who will speak up for libraries, who will speak up for our rec centers. Um, you know, that, that is what I want to add my voice to on the council table is to, to advocate for these things and work with my council colleagues to be able to ensure that we're adequately funding our libraries, our recreation centers, our community centers. Um, we, we can't be moving backwards on these things. Our community is growing. Coquitlam is going to keep growing. Um, and we have more people coming and we need to make sure that these, these spaces are there for people. And, you know, when I think about... Uh, uh, the number of newcomers um, that are coming to Coquitlam. And, and um, I mean, we're, gonna, we're likely to have some Ukrainian refugees coming. Um, the Coquitlam Public Library was huge for assisting uh, Syrian refugees when they came in um, several years back. Uh, w- when I think about libraries and community spaces, it's also that, that touch point too for mm-hmm. newcomers. They're, they're taking English language classes there. They're, they're meeting other people who might be from their community there. It's, it's how we bridge people who might be new to not just Coquitlam, but Canada, with the broader community. Well, I became first like aware of how important they were in that respect when we actually worked with some Syrian refugees, mm-hmm. and that the library was um, like a safe, accessible place that anybody can go to, um, and even like during the heat dome and, and things like that. It's it's one place where a community has full access, right? It's mm-hmm. fully accessible, so. I think that's a really important role above and beyond, you know, checking out books. 
Um, and you had also mentioned community centres. So do you see um, more roles for community centres as um, the, the community builds and expands? Yeah, and, and I think w with a community centre, I, I just want to make a, a, a distinction between a community centre and a recreation centre. Because a recreation centre, is it's it has your pool, maybe your ice right. rink, your gym, you're going to go there, you're going to get your exercise in, your programming. Uh, but a community centre is really, each one should be unique to the needs of its community. And I think they're important to have community direction and community involvement. So almost like a uh, neighborhood house? Almost like a neighborhood okay. house, right? And and I think Vancouver has been pretty successful in this, where they're able to blend having city staff involved with administering the buildings, but also having volunteers that kind of guide the neighborhood in terms of the programming needs. Um, you know, I think of uh, Place Millardville and what's, what's, what happens there and the programming there might be a little bit different than what happens at Dogwood Pavilion, which is geared a little more to seniors. Um, they serve two different purposes based on the needs of the community. Can and you give us some examples of, of programming? Like what kind of programming are you talking about? Well, for about? example, um, I'll use Dogwood. Um, they, they have volunteers that are engaged there, a board that kind of guides programming, and it's, it's a lot of seniors, and they might really think about they bring to the perspective of, of seniors living in Coquitlam and talk about what kind of programming they would like to see. And that's really where I think community centers play a huge role. They're, they're a gathering place okay. and one where I think it's important to have people that feel they have a very vested interest in them. Um, often that they can volunteer as, as, a, as a board member and be able to provide some sort of input in how they're, how they're run and what they're doing there. Right, so the community would be able to drive the type of programming and, and sort of customize it for their yeah. needs and, and their demographics. Perhaps. Exactly, and, and okay. with the support of city staff, right? Um, right. Uh, because it's important that we have our, you know, we don't want to leave just everything to volunteers. These are volunteers too, and so we right. need to make sure we have like actual staff there to be able to support the work they're doing. Yeah. And resources. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. 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 Yep. No, that sounds like um, some interesting ideas. And then as far as um, sports, and that kind of um, goes more under the recreation center that you were talking about as well as sports fields. Yes. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a big part of Coquitlam, and I think it's so important for, for kids as well as for adults too that play sports. I, I grew up playing hockey. I was a goalie, um, mm -hmm. uh, which so it might be uh, might have driven me into this life of running for public office, being under pressure and having to take some shots. Um, <laughs> okay. <but it's>, Mostly <laughs> shots to the head, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good preparation. <laughs> Had a few of those. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, 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 it's something so important, again, going back to that fostering community piece, mental health, physical health. Um, you know, this next term of council is going to be making some big decisions around uh, ice rink space. Planet Ice is getting up in its up in its mm -hmm. years, and we're going to be making some decisions around what happens with that. Um, we have the Burke Mountain Rec Center that's coming, and I think we need to be talking about what's going to be going in there. And soccer continues to grow at a huge pace. Mm -hmm. We're seeing so many more kids play soccer now. And how do we get more field space and turf space as as the community grows? And um, I, I would be remiss if I did not also mention pickleball as being a it's up and coming. Very up and coming sport. Okay. And finding space for that. Is that more seniors or is it just no, everybody? No, it's everybody. Like it's it's, it's seniors. It. It's people people of all ages. Um, it's I'm kind of learning the ropes about it too. Mm -hmm. um, I've I've only heard about it in recent years, but it's uh, it's quite neat. Uh, yeah. So it's like tennis, but not. It's tennis? it's much closer, um, and and it's a little more in. How would I phrase it? Is it's a little more accessible, I guess I would say, and, and, and there's that opportunity for a little more socialization, I think, because players are they're playing a little closer together, so you get some more of those kind of conversations going on, too. And, um, but tennis is another big one where it, it's, and that is such, such the challenge, too, and I think um, for council, too, is how do we balance all these needs, mm -hmm. right? Because there's, we have very unique sports groups that need things, arts and culture groups, um, while also still making sure that you know, we're keeping property taxes in check for residents as well, right? Um, and that is a big question. How, how are you going to balance, or how are you going to ensure that that balance is in place between um, sports, arts, and culture, and you know, the other pieces of the pie there? It's, it, it's where I feel that it's listening is such a huge part of the role, because no city councillor, I think, knows everything. Mm -hmm. And we all have different lived experiences. Right. We all have different backgrounds. And that's where 
having such an ear to the ground with these organizations and their needs and what they really want to see and being able to have all of these come together and really think about how do we balance these things in an equitable way, in an affordable way. And it's, it's, it's always going to be a challenge, I think, is how, we, how do we invest, keep investing in these things, moving the city forward. What I'll tell you I'm certainly not for, and, and I mean we see some candidates talk about it, is the, you know, we're just, we're just going to slash things at City Hall, we're going to cut mm -hmm. spending, we're going to cut staff. I'm not a believer in that. I think we have great staff at City Hall. I think we're doing great things. I believe in moving the city forward, not back. Yeah, that's that's kind of like an austerity kind of approach mm -hmm. wh when people take that. I'm interested. I'm interested in some of the things that you said. Like, uh, you focused a lot on sports and things like that. Whereas, um, and I have a I have a sports background as well. I've coached in the back in my life. I too played hockey, and I as well. I'm a what goalie. What position? I'm a goalie. <laughs> you were a goalie too. Okay. I am indeed. Well, I've actually I'm a, I'm a bit of. Do you remember way back there used to be such a thing called a rover who would be both be a goalie and a and out. I, uh, I remember some like yeah. that's kind of how we would start where because yeah. you want to get a kid interested in it. Yeah, that's yeah. that's how I. I, I was I started, a rover yeah. in with in the in the the leagues that I played in. Um, no, but what I'm interested in is um, I'm also. Um, involved in the arts mm -hmm. and cultural side of things quite heavily and and you spoke mostly um, and and this is again not challenge you uh, this is conversational this is an important thing for me to know about somebody um, you spoke mostly about sports and you didn't speak about culture that much but definitely that's going to come across your table how mm -hmm. are you going to address those things where where there, there there's a council has to address the the scope of everything. Both it might be it might be sports versus culture. It might be the needs of um, developers versus the general public. It might be the difference the differences that you have between in the population just based on their um, ethnic backgrounds mm -hmm. and things like that. These things are all going to come at you. How are you going to handle things like that? Well, if I can just start on the arts, maybe just touch sure. on arts and culture quick, is because um, I that has been a lot of uh, my city involvement too. Um, my I, I kind of got my start in in the community as I was a volunteer on the Evergreen Line Public Art Task Force okay. uh, years back, and, and sure. really got to learn and see an appreciation for public art right. and how mm. how it beautifies our neighborhoods, how it brings people together. Um, I, I'm so proud of the the big frog at Lafarge Lake Station. Um, mm. I, I I really love seeing those kind of uh, public art projects that bring folks together and and often arts and culture does maybe I'm wrong in saying this but it, I, I do sometimes feel like it gets overlooked um, mm. and it is so important it's sort of important. a nice to have instead of a need yeah to have. but it is a need yeah. to have it I think is. for a yes. healthy community that it's it's I mean whatever whatever green arts the the cultural center there uh, and plaster arts offer the community mm -hmm. it's so huge to our our heritage culture fostering creativity um, the programming they do with kids is incredible and I think too, too often people might say oh you know arts and culture is just painting pictures mm -hmm. it's about fostering creativity and and that applies to every facet of life whether you're running for a city councilor and thinking how can I be creative about solving problems or if you're in the business community or even if you are just doing more of what you think of as traditional art like creativity and and fostering that in all ages is I believe um, I think it's personal growth and community growth, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's sort of a bridge that everybody can do art and appreciate art and mm -hmm. um, without it, I, we're a, a colder <laughs> sort of place to live, I think, so it's yeah. important. And, and I think just, just so on the balancing piece, it's, you're absolutely right, the balancing is, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not an easy thing to do. But it, I go back to this is where listening to community groups, to people, to really understanding their needs, their lived experiences, how they view issues, being able to bring these together, being able to see where can people work together, where can we maybe bring things together um, and make multiple things happen. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking to, like, like kind of going back to housing a little bit, um, you know, I've had some conversations with um, some faith-based organizations who might say, look, you know, we have an older, we have an older church, we're sitting on a lot of land, we, we probably need a new building and, and you know, how do we go about doing that? Well, how can we pair that maybe with, with a developer, with the city, with the province to be able to say, look, how do you get a new church? 
as well as then building some social housing as part of that to really fulfill that um, that sort of social purpose that mm -hmm. that faith-based group it's might be trying to It's a social housing, do. daycare? And, and exactly, and, and we're seeing it, a project just like that at um, uh, where the Como Lake Church was. Um, they're doing that exact kind of project. And that's really what I want to see more of, is bringing partners together to be able to mm -hmm. move the city forward in ways, um, yeah. Look for some synergies. Um, you know this is going to come up at some point with me and Brad. It's the environment. Yes. We're talking about development. We're talking up versus out. We're talking green space versus you know developed space and impermeable surfaces and all the things that go with it. Climate change um, concerns with that. So again, a question similar to what Brad asked about priorities and dividing the pie up and finding the balance. How do you, how would you find a balance between development versus what we need as green space or urban forest areas? Well, the, and, and it's, I think that's an excellent point, right? And we, we know urban forests are, and, and we saw it last summer, we know how critical these are to keeping temperatures cool. Um, so we know, and we also know how important they are for mental health. People need that nature space as well. Um, we can't just have a concrete jungle. So we need to be working with developers to be able to say, how do we incorporate green space into our developments? Um, when I think about tree retention, um, you know, we know with some trees, once they're fully mature and their roots are spread out, that we, can, we are able to build around some of these. Sometimes I do find that the answer to saying, oh, we can cut trees down is, is an right. often easy choice to make, right? When we could be building and incorporating forests into our community. Um, parts of Coquitlam are very much like that, where their neighborhoods built in forests. Um, and with urban areas, more like when I'm thinking town center too, it, it is that challenge where we know building dense can have, uh, is good for climate change. And we know we want people to be using public transit and the huge amount of savings that means for greenhouse gas emissions. But how do we still make sure in these areas next to a transit station, mm -hmm there's green space when there's such a development pressure to be just putting up a tower everywhere. So, you know, we're gonna have density near SkyTrain stations. Um, that, that's good for yeah. the climate. But we also need to make sure that all the people that are moving into these dense areas have parks and urban forests that they can visit. Uh, because living, you know, as, so, as someone who lives in a one bedroom condo with their partner, um, we're often looking to try and get out. Um, there's times she's had enough of me and wants to, you know, go out to the park. <laughs> go for a walk in the park. <laughs> I've been talking about too many, po too much politics, and <laughs> right. she needs a break from it. Uh, but we need that, right? So yes. it, we we can't just remove all of our urban forests mm -hmm. um, for density. We need to be having the density be built around and include urban forest space and the recreational park space. The, there are standards, though, um, that the city already. If you talk to the the, the engineers and the planners in the city. They already have a sets of standards. So where do you, th where do you, th like if you look at some of the, where we are right here, where we're probably um, eight or ten blocks from Coquitlam Center, and some of the developments behind there, there are some. I, I don't know about forty story. At forty, is that? Got some big ones. 20, 20 stories. I don't know how many stories. There are some. 40s, oh yeah. There are yeah. some tall buildings back there, and they built right into the structure small private gardens. Um, so they're they're trying to address that as we speak, and then you see plazas in the downtown. Um, is that the downtown core of Coquitlam? There are some plazas and Spirit things like that. There, yeah, yeah. Do you do you think that um, is it your opinion that there needs to be more of that, or and they need to spread out more when they're doing that? Like, how do you feel about what they're doing? As as you know, we have three SkyTrain stations in the town center area, yeah. and, and there's going to be more towers coming mm -hmm. up. So we need to make sure that we are including likely more park space, plaza space, those urban forest pieces. Um, and, and I really want to stress the public piece to those two, that we need public spaces yes. that everyone's able to access and gather in. I think it is good that developers are including community garden spaces and w as part of their buildings, but that public piece on the ground is, is so that it is so important. We can't just mm -hmm. leave it up to having gated gardens. And when you talk about public spaces, is it just developers that, um, does it just fall on developers' shoulders or does it also fall on the city? Because there are city lands as well. Mm -hmm. um, should we be, you know, trying to retain more of those as natural spaces? 
I know there's always, and that's where that real pressure comes, right? Development versus what do we leave green? Well, uh, absolutely. And, and I'm a big believer that public land needs to be used in the public interest, whether it mm -hmm. be on the housing side or on more of a park side. Um, I think too often we have, not so much today, I think there's a recognition of it now, but in the past, quick to just sell off public land for a quick buck. Yeah. Um, and then we end up years down the road thinking, oh geez, we kind of need some land for a rec center or school or, or housing and then need to buy it back at an astronomically high pay, uh, mm -hmm. price. Um, so when I think about public land, I'm, I really look at it in the lens of like, how do we use it in the public interest? Um, yeah. So I'm a big believer in that. And yeah, it's, it's, it, it is that perennial challenge of balancing density, um, which has its environmental benefits. Of, mm -hmm. you know, we, like I said, we, we want people to be using transit more. We know that's good for the environment, um, yeah. but we also know that we can't just have that housing piece. Um, Town Centre Park is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I, think it, I think it is a wonderful park and council, and, and kudos to city staff for what they've done there and really made it like such a centre of not just Coquitlam, but the Tri-Cities. Um, we have wonderful events there. Um, you know, I, I usually go for walks around the uh, the hatchery on uh, Hoy Creek there, and it's yeah. uh, it, we have some lovely spaces there. So it's making sure that we protect those as well, um, as we know more people are going to be coming there, um, and also looking at for opportunities where we can be including more nature park space and regular park space. Yeah. How do you feel about community gardens? Oh, they're fantastic. We have one over in um, the Coquitlam area. Um, we don't have too many in Coquitlam. But I'd certainly love to see more and looking for neighborhood associations that might be able to take some of that work on uh, and working with the city um, to have more garden space. That would be a nice community builder. I think you've got, like you oh, say, yeah. your neighborhood house, you've got municipal staff, you have community input and in getting people out into maybe not quite nature, but <laughs> into a more natural And setting. really just looking at how do we bring all these pieces together? How do we bring, whether a community center, or garden space, can they be on the same plot of land? How do yeah. we think about them together? And it's, you know, we, we have an urban containment zone. And, and I think the, we're entering this so, sort of um, a new opportunity coming where the days of suburban sprawl are over. We can't just mm -hmm. keep building out and out. So we need to be thinking very creatively with the land that we have and how we're, how we're redeveloping it what we're developing and making sure it meets the needs of the community. I'm Maybe. going to ask you a challenging question. Let's do it. Okay. Because what you said, you, we can't keep building out and out. Why not? We've got lots of land in BC. We've got tons. Why don't we just keep moving out right to the very borders of Coquitlam? Why don't we do that? We have, well, I mean, there's a number of reasons for it. So there are some serious environmental ramifications to that if we start clear cutting everything way up in the mountains and what that's going to mean for construction runoff and getting into creeks and our hatcheries. Um, we've seen the consequences of that. And we know climate change is a very real threat to us. We are truly feeling today the consequences of that. We only need to look at last summer's heat dome, looking at um, uh, the flash floods that happened mm -hmm. uh, in Merritt and the Coca-Cola being wiped out. Uh, climate change is a very real threat, so we need to be thinking about how are we building resilient infrastructure to climate change, um, and also like how how do we build resiliency to it, and also address it and do our part there too. So mm -hmm. it's it's that two pronged approach to it as well. Um, but we can't just keep building out. We can't. We know we can't for the environment. We know we're out of land. That's you know we 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 want to be able to address climate change, and that means thinking smart with how we do development and not just sprawling out. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're, you prefer building up? I think building up where we have transit is, is a key thing, but it's also about including that gentle density. And, and this is, again, kind of going back to our beginning of our discussion, mm -hmm. is that continuum of housing. So when I think about Como Lake or Austin Avenue, I envision seeing your four-story, six-story wood frame walk-ups where we have more transit investment that can be taking people to SkyTrain stations, mm -hmm. um, more opportunities for people who are using e-bikes. Um, so having those bike lockups that we have at SkyTrain stations are great for um, fostering that adoption. It's it's not so it's, it's there's building up, but also it's it's building smart too, and building walkable communities, places where people mm -hmm. maybe are going to be able to think twice about driving and walking to get groceries, 
or going to get a cup of coffee or meeting friends. Having that livable, walkable community is, is so important to addressing climate change. Which is a little bit more of a European model, I think. And we've seen that in, in other countries where, I mean, you look at the way their cities are developed and that's exactly what they have. Um, and having like neighborhoods, sort of. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're sort of getting to that point where we're, we're having to think about this. And, and it's, it's going to create a new set of challenges that a lot of municipalities haven't really had to grapple with in the past. Mm -hmm. But it also creates great opportunities for us, too, where we can have these kind of walkable communities we've always wanted. Um, but it, it's also about that gentle density piece. Like towers, they have a role to play for sure in urban cores, but that's not going to be the whole of the community. So thinking more about row homes, thinking townhouse complexes, thinking your four-story walk-ups. Um, mass timber is becoming right. more and more of a viable technology that we can use for building green efficient homes. Mm -hmm. Which means we're getting materials within our own, you know, mm -hmm. we can get them within yeah. 100 miles, exactly. so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we are, we, we, we have only got a few minutes left at this point. Um, I'm getting signals from the side that <laughs> we've got to hurry up. Um, I have one burning question before yeah. okay. you go ahead. <laughs> and I'm, I think I might have lost my question. Why don't you go ahead? I'm sorry. I hope no, I didn't okay. do that. No. Well, um, I'm off the hook, I guess. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this one, in municipal elections, and this is maybe just a more general question, um, I think the last election in Coquitlam, we saw one in four people come out to vote. Mm -hmm. So 25%, three quarters of the people are not even voting. Can you tell us why is it so important for people to get out and vote at the municipal level? Local government is the level of government that affects people in their day-to-day -day life, whether it be your garbage pickup, filling a pothole, snow plow renewal, those, those core city services we think of, the basics. Um, uh, you would feel these things, if they disappeared, you would feel their effects immediately. Um, it's water treatment. It's land use planning. It's really that when, when you look outside your window and what you see and the city services you'll spot day to day are the responsibility of local government. Right. Um, it is so important that people vote in that. Um, your mayor and council do a lot of stuff that affects your life okay. and you should be engaged in that. It's, it's important to and, and it's so important to also have a council that you know really represents the community and brings a unique set of values and ideas and and I feel very strongly that like I can add add a unique voice to council as someone who's I'm younger I'm a renter I'm, I'm really feeling you know like many the the effects of the affordability crisis and you know the decisions council makes are going to have effects for decades and um, I'm I would it would be an honor to be able to work with council and moving the city forward and okay. yeah thank I, you for I, that I think okay, I think what I'm hearing is that um, by having a younger voice on council, it brings a diversity that we have yet to see mm -hmm. uh, on our council and I'm uh, on Coquitlam Council. And I'm looking back to my memory and I'm looking for somebody who's a, a younger voice. There have been a couple, I guess, but um, at the present, it, it, it's void of that age group. So that brings me though to um, that question that I wanted to ask, which was, you're going to, you're, you're going, if you're successful in finding your way onto council. Um, y you're going to more than likely come, again, come up against strong opinions that will conflict with what you're thinking. And we've seen, um, Nancy and I, we started this challenge of, of doing We've Got Issues um, by talking to people, politicians, um, about safe workspaces. And uh, our concern was mostly about work, people working together and feeling like they can do that. Um, what's your feeling on that, and how do you think that you'll be able to traverse that kind of um, that kind of situation when you're you're coming up against people with strong opinions that might be contrary to your own? Yeah, and it, 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 to me, it's so much about having strong working relationships with your council colleagues. And I think there are some wonderful people on Coquitlam Council right now. Uh, you know, I, I, Chris Wilson has been an incredible mentor for me, for example. Um, and, and I've worked with council members, whether it be on library board or in the community, and yeah, you're right, there, there are a few where we do have differences of opinion, and, and that's okay. Res disagreeing in a respectful way is okay. And what I really believe in is that that kind of disagreement needs to be kept in a respectful frame, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in that. It's, it's why you know, I'm, I want to run a positive campaign, and I 
you know, people ask me about whether it be a city councilor or another candidate, I'm very open with what I think they're, they might be doing well and what I can work with them on. Um, and I think it's, I, I want to bring that kind of positivity to council. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so um, do you have any other questions, Nancy? I think I'm good. Good. Um, awesome. Yeah, so so you. Matt, I really appreciate you being here well, today. Well, I, I really appreciate both of you inviting me. Like this is, this is fantastic. And um, I'm sure we could sit here talking all day about local issues. I, I, I think there's lots to speak of or to talk about. There's one thing that I have to ask you before we're gone. Okay. Butterfly or stand up? Butterfly. Ooh. I am much more of a butterfly. I think oh, I, yeah? I'd like that more. That yeah. Uh, yeah. I wasn't the most most flexible. My skating, yeah. a little. Uh, How are my, your knees? My puck handling, no good. Knees were fine. It was always like you kept myself in a good position, getting the butterfly, and yeah. I had the angles good. Okay. So it was all about that. Keep you, the angles you, strong. You had the advantage, I think, <laughs> of the really nice pads. I had the older. I had Dump the older ones. Pads. I, I still remember getting my first pair of nice pads. They were just that sleek kind of white, and they. I loved them so much, I didn't even want to use them. I just, because I didn't want them to get marked up. All right. I, I can relate to that. I understand that completely. Thank you for speaking question. to me in a very cryptic manner yeah. that nobody else here understands. Um, so, uh, thanks, Matt, again, for being here um, for We've Got Issues with Nancy and myself. Um, we'd like to, before we go, we'd like to thank TELUS Optic for their support, the Fountainhead Network, and there's somebody else that I'm missing. Um, Tri Cities Community Tri oh, Television, the, oh, the, the wonderful City folks. Community TV. <laughs> oh, those guys, those guys that just do all the work. <laughs> all right, so thank you for being here. Um, thanks for uh, taking the time to to listen to Nancy and I grill poor Matt for. Not for at all. It was a lovely conversation. Right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks.